Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Welcome to module 2.3 then. And just to remind you what we did in the last two modules this week is we introduced this model starting from an energy momentum relation. And the last module, we used this idea that electron is a wave with a certain de Broglie wavelength, which has to fit into a box. And that gives you the number of states available up to a given momentum p, that is this n of p. And these two can be combined to obtain the number of states up to a given energy, whose derivative then is the density of states. And in the first module, that's 2.1, I showed that there is a general relationship that should hold irrespective of the energy momentum relation. And that is d times v times p should be n times the number of dimensions. And this is a relation that I'll make use of in this module as we talk. Now, my purpose in this module, though, is something like this. Okay, we are talking about, say, some a conductor with some energy moment where electrons obey some energy momentum relation, and there's an electrochemical potential that tells you the level up to which electrons are filled. And let's assume we are at low temperatures, so basically everything below it is filled, everything above it is empty. And when you put a little bias across it, current flows. And the conductivity, the approach that we have discussed, gives us an expression for conductivity that depends on the density of states in this energy range around the electrochemical potential. Now, on the other hand, the textbook way of obtaining conductivity is usually would give you a very different looking expression for conductivity, and this is known as the Drude formula. So the expression that you would normally see in the literature would look something like this. Sigma is equal to Q squared tau over M. So Q is the charge on an electron. Tau is the mean free time. M is the mass of an electron. And this is multiplied by the number of electrons per unit volume, length, area, or volume, depending on how many dimensions we are doing this in. So the expression you'd see most commonly would be something like this. N, you know, 1 over L or 1 over WL or 1 over AL. Because this N is the total number of electrons, which means all the electrons in these states up to here. Because all these states are filled. This is low temperature. Everything below it is filled. Everything above it is empty. So that's this end. Now, this is a rather different view, though, because one of the things I insisted right in the beginning is that current flow only depends on the electrons in this energy window. Things down here don't really matter. On the other hand, this approach tells you that current flow depends on the total number of electrons. And that looks like a very different thing. And what I'll try to show you is that that approach actually is equivalent to this if you only have states described by a single energy momentum relationship. On the other hand, there are all kinds of situations where this one won't work very well. You'll have problems with this. But what we have obtained already, namely the expression that we started with, this Q square diffusion coefficient times this density of states, that expression is much more general. This holds in general, whereas this root formula is a specialized thing which is sometimes equivalent, but cannot really be used in general. But usually people remember the root formula. That's what they usually think in terms of. And the reason is something like this, that in the normal approach, you see, 
The root formula is relatively easy to obtain. In fact, I'll explain to you in a minute how we get that. And so, if you take a standard solid state physics text, that will usually be in, like I say, chapter one. Whereas this would be, would come much, much later after you have gone through advanced formalisms. But what our bottom-up approach, where we started from this idea of an elastic resistor, allowed us to do was, we obtained this result in a relatively elementary way. And the point I want to make is, this is really much more general. This is the one you can count on in general, is more generally applicable. Whereas the other one, the other one is relatively specialized, sometimes works, but you can get into trouble even if you just try to apply it to graphene, for example. Because with graphene, as we discussed, the energy momentum relationship is linear. It doesn't look like what I've drawn here. It looks like E equals V zero P. So it's li linear with momentum. And in that case, it's not obvious what mass to use even here, for example. On the other hand, if you're using the other relationship, there is no problem because regardless of what the energy momentum relationship is, you can always calculate the density of states like we discussed. There's a well-defined diffusion coefficient and there's really no problem. Whereas here, you immediately get into questions about what mass, for example, and we'll see what actually one should use. That's kind of what we'll be talking about in this module and the next one. Okay. Let me just quickly outline how people obtain this result. And the argument, let's just do it in 1D for simplicity, that usually the argument goes that electrons are driven by electric fields, and so the force that an electron feels is QE, and according to Newton's laws, QE should be equal to m dv dt. And of course, if this were everything, then when you apply an electric field, the electron should be continually accelerating, but instead it reaches a steady state because when electrons are going through a solid, it's like going through a very viscous medium where there is a very strong viscous drag, which you model as V M V over tau. So this is what you call the mean free time. That's the momentum, and the more the momentum, more the momentum that is lost due to this viscous drag. I'm not going through this too carefully because the, my whole purpose is just to give you an idea of how this argument goes, and I'm not going to make use of any of this. The only reason we are going through this is this is the standard thing that you'll see in freshman physics. This is the result that's most widely known, and since our result looks a little different, I feel it's useful to try to connect the two. So, and just want to remind you, if you have seen this before, how this one is obtained. So then you say that at steady state, we can drop this, and that tells you that the momentum, the steady state momentum that electrons will achieve will be given by Q E tau. And I can take the M here. And then the argument goes that the current is that the current depends on, is given by Q N V. Uh, I guess if we are doing this in one dimension, it's the number of electrons per unit length times V. And this you can argue, again, from elementary considerations that if you have a bunch of, if you have a certain number of electrons per unit length, all traveling with a certain velocity, then the then the rate at which electrons will cross you per second will be number of electrons per unit length times velocity. This is kind of, it's a fairly simple argument based on the idea that, you know, if you had a bunch of electrons traveling with some velocity, then if I stand here and watch how many cross me, what I can show is the number that will cross me per second will be the number of electrons per unit length times that. And now if I, and if I multiply by the charge on an electron, I'll get the current. So this then leads to Q square, you know, Q N, L, N over L times V. So it's Q square over M tau and this N times V. 
cetera. And this is then what leads to this expression for conductivity that I mentioned before. This is what you'll see in freshman physics texts. Now, what is problematic about this is, you know, it's a very simple derivation, which is why you see it everywhere. The problematic about it is it raises all kinds of questions. So, for example, if indeed electrons move due to an electric field, then what about all the other states down here? Because as I mentioned, usually in a solid, you, you don't just have one little energy band here. You have electron, all kinds of energy levels available at different energies way down here also. And what this energy momentum relation that we talk about, that's something that just applies to this narrow energy range. That's where you can use that. Down here, you cannot really use, there's all kinds of states down here, which you are not accounting for. But if electrons move due to electric fields, then you would think that all these electrons should be moving. Why just these? Well, that's where you say that, well, you know, some electrons are free and some aren't. So these are the free electrons. And so you see, you kind of have all kinds of mysterious issues coming up. Why are some electrons free? Why aren't these things conducting, etc.? On the other hand, the viewpoint that we adopted here, that gives a very natural explanation for this. And that is what we did in week one. Namely, only those electrons conduct which are in this energy range between mu1 and mu2. Why? Because those are the states that one contact wants to fill up, another contact wants to empty. Down here, both contacts want to keep them filled, which is why they stay filled, nothing happens. You see? So it follows very logically, there's really no problems there. Whereas, this picture, you see, it's simple, but it raises all kinds of issues if you think too deeply. Okay. Now, what I want to show then is, quickly, is how our expression here will actually get you this expression also, if you ignore all these other bands and just work with one band like this, given some energy momentum relation. And what we do here is, we make use of this a relation that we obtained in module 2.1. This dVp equals nd. So let me write that up here. We'll see. So the expression I want to make use of is that the density of states times vP is equal to n times d. So what you can see is the expression for conductivity I have there, I could write in the following way. Q square, and then there is the diffusion coefficient, which is V square tau divided by D, the number of dimensions. As you as we have seen, one dimension is one, two dimension is half, three dimensions is one over three, that V square tau over D. And then there is the density of states. And then, you know, like 1 over L or 1 over WL or 1 over AL, depending on whether we have a 1D conductor, 2D conductor, or a 3D conductor. Okay. So, next step is, instead of dV, let me replace from this expression. So, what you would get then is Q square dV divided by the number of dimensions is equal to n divided by p. So what you'd have is something like this. V, maybe I'll write tau first. V, and then dV divided by d. And what I'm saying is we could replace that quantity dV divided by the number of dimensions with n divided by p. So I could write here n divided by p. So now if you compare to the root formula from here, so let me just write that here for comparison. So the root formula is Q square tau over M times N 
times 1 over L 1 over W L. So you'll see those are those look basically the same equation. You see, looks very similar, and the two would be equivalent if we identify mass as momentum divided by velocity. Now, which of course looks well. You might say, well, p equals mv. We know that you know momentum is mass times velocity. Yes, but that again is you when you have a parabolic relation like E equals P squared over 2M. Let me so when you have E equals P squared divided by 2M, then velocity is in general dE dP and that's equal to P over M. And so, this uh, this looks fine. This is the one that we're used to. On the other hand, if you are talking of, say, graphene, where E is equal to V0 P, then you'll notice, actually, velocity is constant. Is dE dP is just a constant number V0. It's independent of momentum. So what that means is that if I looked at the mass it would be P over V, the V is a constant, and so the more the momentum, bigger the mass. So it is almost as if electrons here with less momentum have a small mass, and electrons when they go up there, they have a much bigger mass, you see? And this leads to unusual properties when you try to look at the conductivity, and that is kind of what we, We'll talk about in the next module a little more that the consequences of this of not having a parabolic relation that is this e equal pro being proportional to p square that's what you normally call a parabolic relation in the sense this is like, if you had pl plotted it it would look like a parabola but if you don't have a parabolic relation like a linear relation or anything else then you see the mass can be not a constant but something that depends on energy. And in that case, you have to interpret conductivity that you measure much more carefully, taking into account the fact that the mass itself is energy dependent. So this is what I'll talk about in the next module.